Okay, I think we're getting ready to, to go into this. Uh, Larry, N7BCP, is going to get, give a presentation on develop, met, developing information services for APRS with DigiNED and Microsoft Visual Studio. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're way over my head. I don't even know what that means. But we'll, we'll sit here, there's, there's something to learn for everybody, including Bill. Bill has a lot that he needs to learn, I know that. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Bill to do the proper presentation since he knows Larry and he's going to go chat him a few times. I'm, I'm lucky I've got so much to learn. Last year, I uh, had a little setup in uh, Centralia where I had DigiNet talking to QRZ. And one morning I was in Mc... Some of you heard this before, but that's okay. One morning I was in McDonald's having breakfast, and I saw a car pull up and it had ham plates on it. And I thought, ah. So I punched in QRZ in the APRS thing that I had running, pushed the button, came back, and gave me the guy's name. So this ham comes walking in the door, and I say, hi, Bruce. And he looks at me, and he's like, he knows me. I don't know him. I forgot his name. Oh shoot! <laughs> so, and he was, you know, we've all been there, had that embarrassed feeling. So, and then I went over and I said, "Oh, I got this APRS deal hooked up, and I got this new you know, that's cool." So I was kind of fun. That evening, I was in the Starbucks across the street, telling this story to Kim. I parked pulled up with the ham plates. I, I couldn't have timed this better. I, I punched in the call sign. He gave me the name. Hi Brian. Funny look on his face. It was it was so classic. We couldn't have done it, you know, we couldn't have done it any better if we planned on it. At Seaside, I was talking to some folks and we were talking about these cool things you can do. And uh, talking to Larry, uh, Microsoft guru. And I said, you got all these cool Microsoft tools, you can redo this, you know, with Microsoft and do it with the, you know, the free tools. And he thought about it a minute, eyes kind of lit up, and he said, yeah, we can. And what's really neat is um, Larry has taken it the next step further. With my system, I could always, I could say, you know, QRZ, here's a call sign, or I could say QR, you know, what else did I do? Um, zip code. I could, I could ask for the zip code and it would put a little object on the map and I could see where it was at. But I was always, it was a fixed location. I couldn't say, who is the nearest post office to me? Where is the nearest hospital? Where is the nearest, uh, let's get something really important. Where is the nearest coffee shop? Well, Larry, Larry has had a few uh, sleep deprived nights and he has modified DigiNed using freely available Microsoft tools, a little bit different platform than what I was using. But he has taken this to the next step, where not only can you ask about a coffee shop, it'll tell you the closest one to where you're at. So as you're driving down the street, you can say, I need pizza, I need coffee, and you just put in coffee, and it'll say, it's down this, you know, 0.2 miles to the left. It, well, okay. <laughs> I, I cannot confirm nor deny that it will work with beer. <laughs> the development is not done. It's not finished. Anyhow, so Larry's done some great things. This is really going to break open the APRS. And um, we're going to start filling up the 9600 baud with some, you know, we got a good use for it. Anyhow, uh, Larry. Thank you, Bill. Um, my name is Larry DePonte and 7 bcp and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, this platform called DigiNed. Um, can I see a show of hands? Who's heard of DigiNed? All right, about a uh, third of you. Well, um, it's cost me uh, a few sleepless uh, nights, I think, uh, late nights programming when I found out about some of these features. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, a little bit about DigiNed, what it is, and um, how you can um, write some of your own code. I'm going to turn you all to programmers today, and um, you're going to be able to write some information services, some very exciting things. So we'll get started here. Uh, what is DigiNet? Um, it's a low-level software package for creating APRS digipeters. 
it's configurable. It's really configurable. Um, it uses uh, the concept of any files or INI files. They're just text files that have um, uh, values uh, that are used to configure uh, DigiNet. Very easy to configure with just Notepad. Um, it supports multiple ports. Uh, it has call sign substitution features. Uh, it's capable of manipulating the DigiPath. It has a duplicate checker. Uh, MHERD functionality. Uh, telemetry broad, uh, broadcasts and queries. This is really important. Um, you can uh, buy off-the-shelf uh, interfaces or build your own uh, through the parallel port. And through APRS you can actually remotely control or get the status of any device. Uh, can you hear me okay? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. okay, the the uh, so that's uh, uh, another feature of DigiNet. Uh, it has satellite tracking. Um, if it's got up-to-date Keplerian elements, it's able to uh, track satellites and keep those out as objects. Um, it has weather station facilities using uh, this interface. You can plug in your own weather station uh, hardware. Uh, and information object, information and objects. And that's the piece we're going to focus on today, is um, DigiNet's ability to um, respond to queries uh, and send back information um, about local uh, uh, points of interest, um, almost anything actually, so uh, we'll get to that point here in a minute. Uh, who and why? Um, Netherland Amateurs, uh, Hank and uh, Renko, uh, had an idea for weather stations. Uh, they uh, were hands, of course, and software developers, and they saw that APRS was a, a good fit. Uh, the APRS model provides the clients for their weather stations already, so uh, not a lot of work to do there. Um, they want to be able to use uh, cheap, obsolete, um, off-the-shelf hardware, nothing proprietary or custom. There's lots of those 286s around. Um, in Europe, uh, APRS is on 144.8. Uh, novices are not allowed uh, digital there, um, but they are on 70 centimeters, so these guys wanted to develop a, a platform that could do cross-band repeating, so DigiNet is capable of that as well. Uh, at the time, suitable uh, DigiPeter software didn't exist for um, their weather station idea, so um, they were going to have to uh, write their own uh, DigiPeter software. It's developed on top of the AX.25 uh, layer. Um, Digi, DigiNet, uh, Digi for DigiPeter, of course, and Ned for uh, Netherlands, um, uh, which means Netherlands and Dutch, and that's, uh, they're just showing a little bit of pride in their country. Uh, DigiNet is open source. You can download the source and modify it. Um, and so you can just uh, configure it or extend it to your uh, heart's content. Uh, supported operating systems for DigiNet uh, supports the DOS platform on a 286. They think it even will work on an XT, but uh, I don't know if that's actually been tried or not. Um, it'll run on uh, Linux, uh, that's that uh, Unix variant you may have heard of. Uh, I thought I could turn that uh, Virtually any distribution, uh, doesn't require any special uh, features there. Uh, of course it runs on uh, Windows, um, the 9X, Windows 2000, XP, 2003. And uh, today I'll show you running on Vista, which is kind of exciting. Uh, let's see. Hardware, again, 286s, uh, PCs that can support Linux or Windows will do just fine. Um, and uh, the version that runs on uh, Windows supports AGW Packet Engine, so uh, DigiNet can support any of the hardware uh, that AGW supports. That's a very nice feature. Um, now, we're going to talk about these information objects. How do you uh, add those to DigiNet? Well, DigiNet has these configuration files. One of them is called the diginet.mes for message file. Excuse me if I'm going a little faster. I've got a lot of coffee this morning, so. Uh, go, whoa. Uh, this this uh, message file is uh, designed to uh, match patterns that come in on these APRS messages, um, find a match for that pattern, and then send the corresponding response to that pattern. And I'll show you some examples here. The first character that you put in your um, a message file uh, determines how that message is sent back to the APRS user. Uh, for instance, uh, lines that start with a semicolon are transmitted as APRS objects. That's a pretty powerful feature. Uh, so in your DigiNet file, if you put in uh, these lines, question mark, uh, hospital, 
And between these type characters are the different uh, variants of what DigiNet will respond to for hospital. Um, and you see, uh, I live in North Bend, the nearest hospital to me is the Palmy Valley Hospital. So what will happen is this will um, create an APRS object uh, at those coordinates, right on right at uh, Snoqualmie Hospital, and then it'll send back to me, to my client, a message saying um, the object's been added. And then I could uh, use my D700 or my navigation software, find the object, say navigate, and get turn-by-turn -turn directions or, or whatever, depending on what kind of hardware you have. Uh, let's see, lines that start with a colon are, uh, are messages or bulletins, so you could configure a bunch of bulletins for your area, uh, for your DigiNet. Uh, lines that start with an exclamation point, run a program. This is the key feature that we're going to exploit today um, and how you can uh, develop some really exciting um, active information services uh, uh, with this little feature. So in your DigiNet file, in your message file, if you, um, you put in a question mark, and we're gonna, uh, I'm going to show you an example of a find or a search uh, utility that's going to respond to the word find plus anything uh, after that. Um, uh, so we could say find coffee, find hospital, find something like that. Now I'll show you how that works. Uh, this exclamation point says run this program. That's the program that we're going to write uh, this morning. And these uh, percent signs, these parameters, are known by DigiNed and they pass information to my program. For instance, this is the one that uh, took me a couple of uh, late night programmings to add. That percent Z um, will take the last known uh, position report and pass that to our program. So then we can use that position report and pass that to other services to um, get position aware information back, back to us. Um, and this next, uh, this greater than sign here and this word find out out, DigiNed expects results from your program to be written to a file. And this is where you tell DigiNet where the file is, and everything that's in the, in the file that you write is sent uh, to APRS uh, as messages. And we'll show you how that works. Okay, developing for Windows um, is what we're uh, about this morning. Uh, we're going to use a, a tool called Microsoft.NET uh, Frameworks, and we're going to use the Visual Studio development tools. Um, some of you may have received a CD when you walked in. There's, these are the free. Microsoft Visual Studio Express Editions. You can download them too, but uh, it requires a little bit of bandwidth to do that. Uh, if you didn't get a CD, there's a box of them over there. You can pick them up at lunchtime, and uh, you can uh, get home and uh, throw that in there and start to, start developing. Um, these tools run on uh, 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 Windows, 9X, 2000 XP, and Vista. A little bit about Microsoft.net. How many people have heard of Microsoft.net? I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, ooh, but any version of .NET will work. 1.1, uh, even 1.0 if you can find that. Uh, any version, any version. Okay, uh, Microsoft.net is a component that can be added operating system. It's a free download. You can also get it from Windows Update. Uh, provides pre-coded solutions to common programming problems. Um, if I want to write a program that has some sort of user, user interface, it has features for adding buttons and windows and things like that. It has um, APIs for working with data, working with the web, and working with uh, networking. Um, all these things that are uh, very tedious to do for a program where they're done for you. You can uh, worry about just getting on with the business of uh, the program itself. So. Um, .NET is intended to be used for new Windows applications, so it's the new uh, platform for developing uh, Windows programs. Okay, it's getting ahead of me. Okay, it's language neutral. Um, it's a platform that's uh, People are writing new programming languages all the time. Um, there's versions of C, C++, uh, Java type uh, variants. Um, Visual Basic is still supported. How, how many Visual Basic developers are out there? Okay, there's a few. You're, you're in business. Um, and uh, over 20 languages, Perl, uh, um, Pascal, uh, the, you know, many, many program, programming languages. And the current version of .NET right now is 2.0. Again, that's a free download. 
Uh, Visual Studio, which is on this uh, CD as well, um, is a, a development environment for computer programmers. It's a text editor, pro, um, it's a debugger, um, it has built-in help, um, and it coaches you uh, along the way while you're writing a program. Um, it lets developers create standalone applications, websites, web applications, and web services. Um, it's a very, very powerful uh, tool. Um, it's, uh, you can develop uh, programs for uh, Windows servers, workstations, pocket PCs, smartphones, web browsers. It's a, it's a tool that will uh, target all of those platforms. Um, in the little program that we're going to write today uh, for our Windows service, um, we're going to work with a few uh, programming concepts. We're going to create some variables. How many out there have written some sort of program or script at some time? Oh, ah, perfect, okay. So you, uh, you, you're you going to um, be right at home here. We're going to work with some variables. Some of those variables have data types. Uh, those are things like um, numbers, strings. Um, we're going to work with, uh, those are the two ty types of data types we're going to work with. Um, we're going to work a little bit with arrays. Those are just lists of those variables. If we want a list of strings or a list of uh, integers, we're going to use some arrays. We're going to use command line arguments. Um, the program that we're going to write is called a console application. It has no user interface. You're, if you're familiar with the DOS prompt, you're going to start your program, and you're going to type in some arguments after your program name. And uh, so those are the command line arguments. And that's how DigiNet gets the information, like position reports and things like that, from DigiNet to your program, or through these command line arguments. Um, we're going to use a little uh, program flow with if and else statements so that our program can make some intelligent choices about what code it's going to execute. Um, we're going to do a little bit of network access. This uh, uh, program that we're going to write is going to take this APRS query and a position report, and it's going to uh, take advantage of uh, uh, some web services that will take position information and return uh, relevant local information to that uh, free service. Uh, we're going to use the Windows file system. We're going to write out this file that DigiNet will take and use uh, to create its messages. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about error handling. How do you catch errors in your own program and handle those? Uh, somebody out there is uh, sending an APRS message um, and your program can't handle it well. How can you let that user know that there's a problem or that maybe they type something in wrong? So we're going to talk a little bit about error handling. Okay, the Hello World demo. Um, we're going to use a language called C Sharp. It's uh, a, a C variant, and it's uh, been it's becoming very popular in the programming community. And uh, anytime you write your first program in any new language, uh, Hello World is typically the uh, the first one. Uh, we're going to put you put a using statement. This using statement says, "I want to use um, these built-in features of Windows." The system is the uh, the most basic uh, parts of the features. This is going to um, let a program run. We're uh, going to have to add a namespace. Uh, think of this as a way to organize your program um, and give it a name. Uh, our code has to go into a, an area called a class, and I've given it a very inventive name, program. Uh, and then we start with our main function. Okay. Once you get these things out of the way, we're ready to actually have a program do something. Um, this list of arguments here, this Square brackets means I'm going to accept a list of arguments. And those are going to be the arguments that are going to be coming from DigiNet eventually. And all our program does is write to the console, or your DOS prompt, if you will, the words, hello world. And I think we're going to be a little pressed for time, so I can type this in Notepad and compile it and run it, and it would say, hello world. So we can skip on, on, on the next. So programming for DigiNet. Um, what we're trying to accomplish here is we're going to add something to our message file that's going to match a pattern, which is the message that's coming into DigiNet from APRS, and we're going to generate a text response. Um, we're going to do this writing a console application that accepts command line arguments and sends uh, output to a text file. The file contents are then going to be output to APRS's messages. And here's a little diagram of that, of that data flow. You've got your APRS client. This could be UI view, uh, D700, D7, uh, some sort of a APRS client. 
that message uh, uh, is sent to uh, our uh, digipeter. The radio receives it, passes the TNC. A TNC is connected to a computer that's running the DigiNet process. DigiNet says, I see this message. I'm going to now pass it to this user-written program that we're going to write. User-written program says, great, I'm going to process that information, send it back to DigiNet, TNC, radio, and the results come back to the APRS line. So that's the basic flow. We're going to drill in a little bit here and uh, see what's happening um, at a little lower level. Um, again, an APRS message comes in. In this case, we're needing coffee this morning because we were really hurting for coffee. So uh, I might type in question mark sign coffee. Uh, the um, DigiNet process is, uh, we'll assume that you know your radio is turned on and the DigiPeter's up and running. It's going to see that message. And what's going to happen is in our, in our DigiNet message file, it's going to compare that find with the find in the message file. DigiNet's going to say, I find a match for that. They want me to run a program when I find a match for that, so I'm going to execute my find program. That's the one we're going to write. The find program starts up. DigiNet uh, launches it for us. DigiNet passes the command line arguments to our program. In this case, uh, we're going to use the Yahoo search feature, so we're going to create a, uh, a variable that's going to hold the URL. We're going to pull the position and the query from that command line argument that DigiNet sent us. We're going to put that on the end of the URL. And we're going to ship that off to Yahoo. Yahoo's going to say, great, uh, you're at latitude, longitude, you're looking for coffee. I'm going to send you back the results that uh, match that position. That comes back as a bunch of text. Um, in this case, it comes back and in a format called XML, um, Sensible Markup Language. It's a lot like HTML, and it's uh, an easy-to-parse format for programs. Um, so that comes back as a big old string. And somewhere in there is the information you want, the name of the coffee place, where it is, address, maybe phone number, something like that. So our program is going to pull that information out of that response, Hey, we found a couple of jitters in Redmond and Pacific Coast Coffee. Um, we're going to write that to our text file called find.out. Pass that back to DigiNet. DigiNet is going to say, OK, the program's done running. I'm going to look for this output file. It finds it. It's going to send a position. Uh, uh, it's going to create an object in this case, an APRS object, for Coffee 3, Coffee 2, and coffee one, and what you'll see is um, a response saying three objects created. You can then go in your list, find those objects, navigate to them, and it'll actually, uh, in the details, has uh, the address and the city, uh, just to kind of zero in on that. And that's it. So that's how our program is going to work, and that's how we're going to interface with DigiNet. Uh, there's another popular way to get information from the internet. You can't actually find an internet service. Uh, it's designed to be used for service. And this term is called screen scraping. Um, there's a lot of websites out there, like QRZ, for instance. If you put your call sign at the end, they'll send you back You know who that person is, a little bit about them. Um, part of my demo was going to be about that today, but their availability is not 100% today, so we're going to change that a little bit. But what you, the tools you use to, to, to extract that information from that website um, the powerful tool called Reg Regular Expressions, and they're available on many different platforms, including uh, the Windows platform. And uh, what Regular Expressions are, are um, is a way to express a pattern, a, a pattern in a string, um, and it describes a set of strings. It allows you to match those strings and group that information. And it saves you from writing miles and miles and miles of code to parse this HTML. One line of, uh, one line of uh, regular expression would replace you know, tens if not hundreds of lines of uh, parsing code. So a very, very handy tool to uh, learn. Uh, available in many languages. Uh, Perl has it built into its uh, syntax. Perl is a popular string parsing program. It runs uh, primarily on Unix, but it's uh, available on lots of platforms. Um, and I'm going to show you how you can uh, use a regular expression to parse uh, some internet data. We're going to look at some find you data. Um, I stress that if you're going to interface with DigiNet, 
don't find a random website and strip information out because then you're going to be relying on the format of that website and they're not really expecting those kinds of dependencies. So if you're going to do that, make sure your program can respond appropriately if the user changes their website uh, and removes it on you or something like that. Um, let's see, I'm going to go to a demo. And I'm going to be very brave and uh, if I start to go to demo hell, we'll bail out and we'll continue the, uh, we'll continue the presentation. That's complaining that I can't find something on the network. This is Windows Vista, if you haven't seen it yet. We're going to open a, what's called a regular expression designer. It's a tool that lets you um, play with and learn how to build these regular expressions. Um, very, very handy to debug these regular expressions. Um, uh, it's a free download on the internet and um, at the end of the presentation there's a resources link. And so this uh, presentation is uh, will be available on the NWHRS site, uh, and you'll find it that way. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna put the mic down for a minute. Back to the presentation. 
from the current slide, okay? Okay, the Prime Project. We're going to start Visual Studio up. Again, that's the, those are the tools that are on the disk. Uh, we're going to create a new console project. It's one of the types of projects that you can create in Visual Studio. We're going to define some variables. We're going to open an output file so that DigiNet can get the results of our program. We're going to validate some calling arguments. Really uh, important to validate those calling arguments just to make sure they're uh, what you'd expect to, to come in from an APRS message. No hacker or anything like that. We want to make sure our code's uh, safe. We're going to extract, extract the position and the query from those arguments. We're going to set up a URL to call the Yahoo service, search service. We're going to send a web request with that query. We're going to get the response back from Yahoo and process it. Uh, we're going to use the .NET has some features for dealing with XML, kind of like the regular expressions I showed you. It'll parse the XML for you. Uh, we're going to write those values to the output class. We're going to debug our program. I'll show you how to do a little bit of debugging. We're going to add the query to our DigiNet message file, find, execute the program, I'll put the results back, and then we're going to do a live demo. Okay, so we're going to cut away to Visual Studio real quick. Uh, let's see. When a program is slow to start, I'll start it again, and I realize I've got about five copies of it running. Uh, let's see, here's the final program. This little baby uh, kept me up for a couple of nights because I got so excited about writing these features. Um, K7S said, oh, uh, when you saw we were working on this, he goes, hey, Larry, it'd be really nice if, you know, with just know where I was. And I'm like, well, why couldn't we do that? It's got, it's got all the location information. Uh, so, um, I was able to do that. Okay, here's our program. Looks a little bad, but I'll explain some of it here. We've got these using statements at the top. Uh, they tell us we want to use system. I'm, I apologize, I can't see it too well. Um, it's telling us we're going to use the system networking features. We're going to use system I.O., that's input output. That's how we're going to write the file out. Uh, we're going to use the system XML features. That's how we're going to parse the data that comes back from Yahoo, because it's, it's in an XML format. Um, and we're going to use, uh, let's see, we're not going to use regular expressions in this case. Um, okay, you might remember this main function. This is where our program starts. And uh, it's going to take some command line arguments. Those are the parameters that come in from DigiNet. I'm going to start a little tool here so it's going to be easier for everybody to see. Hopefully this works. I should put a magnifier on the screen. Come on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so if you look at the top of the screen, it's what I'm highlighting, it might be a little easier to see. So there's our uh, main function and our arguments that are coming in. Um, we're going to define some variables for our query, our latitude, our longitude. Um, the service also allows you to pass in a radius and miles that you want it to search for and the number of results we want to get back. There's the URL variable called string URL. That's what's going to contain our, uh, our uh, URL in Yahoo. We've got a few other variables to process uh, XML. We've got a writer, which is going to write our text file. We've got an XPath document. That's how we talk to the XML. And we have a results variable right here. Uh, which is where we're going to store our results. You'll see a try block right here. It's really important. You don't want your programs always going to be able to execute. It may be not able to talk to Yahoo or the network or the file system. It might be out of disk space. Who knows? So what you do is you put the code inside this try statement. Because later on, um, if we try and fail, there's a place to catch. And I'll show you that at the end of the program. This is some of the error handling. Very, very important. If you don't do this right and there's a failure, the APRS client is just not going to get a response and they're not going to know um, what, what happened or what went wrong. They're just going to keep sending messages over and over again. You don't want to do that. Um, we're going to create a writer. And this writer is going to write our output file. And our file name is right here. I'm storing the file name and other parts of my program that might change outside of the code in a settings file, just like DigiNet does. So I'm going to read those settings in. 
Um, and those settings are right over here. On the right hand side, there's a project name with all my files. And ahead of time, I predefined all these settings. Um, so if you look at the magnifier at the top, you'll see there's the path to my output files on C colon data and Digimed. Um, I've got some predefined messages that I send back, like the data is not available if I can't find it. A little help file that says um, if I'm there a counter problem, it might be because the uh, APRS client didn't send me the right query. So I will send them a message back saying, here's the syntax that you should use. Uh, let's see here. Uh, message if we encounter an error. Um, a URL to Yahoo. And this little application ID. Yahoo wants you to register. It's free. They just want to know what application is calling them, and it's very easy to get a, uh, an application ID from Yahoo. Uh, and if you have questions, you can talk, talk to me after, this, after the talk here. Okay. Um, now, we're going to look at our arguments that came in. We're going to make sure we got at least uh, four arguments. We need to make sure that we at least have uh, the word the word find. We want to know if we have latitude, longitude. Um, and so uh, we, we check our command line arguments first, make sure we're going to be able to read them. We read the latitude from the first argument. You'll see up on the top it says arcs zero. Zero is the first argument, uh, which is going to be the latitude that VisionNet has this. Longitude. The query itself, which is going to be copy in this case. And we're going to check the other thing. We're going to say if there's additional arguments here when I check the link, it's going to mean that they're passing in the radius and miles that they want me to search for. And if they pass in yet one more argument, um, it means they want to know how many results to send back. So those are optional arguments. And Digimed, I I've said it so that if it can't find position data for you, it says no lap, no long, and then it's going to ask the APRS user to send a beacon uh, so that it can find out where it is and then do it all over again. Let's see here. Here's the URL we're going to construct for Yahoo. We got that out of our settings file. And we're going to add the query, the latitude, the longitude, the radius, and a number of results. Yahoo um, knows how to parse this. And real quick, we're going to go back to the web browser here. And uh, Yahoo has these great APIs. This is the Yahoo Developer Network. And there are searches for um, searching for images, searching for web searches, searching for uh, locations. And we're using their, their location search. This is the XML I told you about. Um, this looks like a lot of information, but you can see it's nicely laid out in results. This is a search I did for pizza around Redmond. There's Pizza Hut, it's on 152nd, Redmond, Thunder. Look at that. Latitude, longitude. Beautiful. We're going to use that to send it back to the APRS plants because they know what to do with that information. Okay? This URL has in it some parameters, and they have to do with my current location. Uh, and what I'm searching for. So that's why the URL is important. And that's what we're manipulating right here. Um, okay, we're going to skip these lines. These are just some setup lines for the XML. You see we have our results. We're going to ask our uh, navigator for the results back from Yahoo. We are going to uh, loop through each of those results one at a time. We're going to pull the latitude and longitude from the results from Yahoo. And then we're going to write to our text file. Let's see. We're going to write, um, we're going to generate an APRS object. APRS objects have a special format. Um, it's going to start with a semicolon. It's going to have the object name, which is exactly nine characters. It happens to be usually what a call sign maximum is, plus the SSID for a little APRS uh, geek there. Uh, we're going to have, uh, let's see, we're going to have the time. We are going to have um, a character that tells us what icon we should put on the map. Uh, you can select from a lot of different icons as a character for that. And uh, let's see, we're going to have position, uh, latitude, and longitude, 
Um, and then at the end, we're going to have the title, which is going to be like uh, round table pizza, the address in the city. Um, depending on what APRS client you use, you'll get more information or, or less, but you'll at least get a position report. Once we've written each of those results to our output file, we send a message back to the APRS user saying, uh, objects were added. That's your cue to go look at your list of objects in your APRS client and see what happened. If we did not get any results, you get a message back saying zero results, so you should change the query or something like that. Maybe maybe you're on the sticks and there's nothing nearby. Okay, that's it. Uh, that's the way the program works. We're going to step through it right now. We're going to do a live debugging session. This is where things can really, really, really go wrong. Uh, I encourage you to test your program carefully before you put it on the air. Make sure it works right. Don't spam uh, the APRS network with a whole bunch of noise uh, and bad, bad data. Um, the catch? Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, very, very important. Don't tell me I didn't put a catch in here. It's down here. There it is. Okay, right here. Okay, things don't go right. I'm basically could be for any number of reasons. This program is, is a little bit stripped down to try to show the concepts. Um, arguably, there'd be a lot more error handling in this program. Um, but I catch all errors and send back to the APRS user um, no data available. That could be for a lot of reasons. If you get very uh, fine-tuned and, 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 and determine that your program encountered some sort of a out of memory, can't talk to the network, you can tell the APRS user a little more, that's probably just going to annoy him. You probably just want to say there's no data. Um, but it's completely up to you uh, how you handle that. Part of the error handling after the catch is what's called a finally block. The finally block is whether things are went perfectly or fail miserably, I need to do a few things before my program uh, stops executing. So we can put those in what's called a finally block. It always executes no matter what. Um, and I'm, I'm going to close the output file. I'm going to make sure the file gets closed and the results are written before my program terminates. Okay, so we're going to try to debug this bad boy. I'm going to set a breakpoint. A breakpoint is where we, is where we want to tell Visual Studio where it should stop when it's running our program so we have a chance to take a look at some things. If we hit the F5 key, cross your fingers, it's going to compile the program. If we've made any changes, it's going to start it. And it's going to start off with the first statement, uh, which is our breakpoint. Um, now, I have added the command line arguments to the debugger as if it had gotten a message from DigiNet. So it's kind of tricking it into think it's actually talking to DigiNet. And to make sure we got some parameters, this is where some of the uh, power of Visual Studio as a development environment really shows is being able to see the contents of all the variables. There's our arts, uh, argument list, and we can go and take a look at it. We can see that it has a find, it's looking for a start box. It has a position report, it's probably North Bend, because that's where I live. Um, 25 mile radius, because I'm going to drive a long way for coffee if I can. That's probably one closer than 25 miles. Uh, and that says, just send me the closest two. All right? Uh, so beautiful. I can actually see what's if my program or Digit didn't pass the right values. I can find out right away, modify my program, run it again. So we'll keep stepping through here. Uh, we're going to see if we have at least uh, four arguments. We do. We're going to pull the latitude, the longitude, and the query. You'll see down in the lower left-hand corner, I've got something that's watching my variables. That's actually showing me the values that it just pulled off the command line argument. So I can see real time here how the program is doing. Uh, I keep stepping through. Um, we're going to say yes, we've got a, a command for a radius, yes, um, we got a command for the number of results we want to get back. Uh, let's see here, we're going to check and see if we've got any latitude uh, errors. We did not, so we've got, uh, we've got some information to work with. We're going to build a URL to call Yahoo with the, uh, with the position information. I can now put my... Uh, cursor over the URL and I can see I've got HTTP, Yahoo.com, local search, and it's got uh, all the information we put in here. We're going to set up, uh, we're going to make the call to Yahoo, that's what this line is doing right now. Oh, beautiful, and we've got an error. 
you don't. Um, okay, that's not fun. Uh, we've got network connectivity. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the remote server returned an error, a bad request. You can see that right here. Look at that. I didn't even have to look, look anywhere, open anything up. So something about my request is wrong. Um, serves me right. Uh, we'll get to skip on here. Assuming you did get the data back from uh, Yahoo, it's going to uh, populate these, write them out to a uh, disk, and we're done. So, you know, we're, we're playing. Okay, I'm going to do a demo, a live demo with Fishing Ed. I'm going to start it up, and hopefully it will run better than the debugging session. Um, let's see, what else can I show you? There's another command window here that lets you test expressions and, about, and, and, and make sure that you've got it right before you put it into your program. Uh, there's lots of help. Uh, if I click on any one of these com commands and hit F1, I'll get full help on how to, how to use that feature. Um, and a really neat thing is as I type, watch this. List that came up. It sees I'm trying to type in something in my program. It says, well, what are the things that you can do right now? So I don't have to go um, searching the documentation for everything. It help, uh, Visual Studio helps you along the way uh, with the syntax. And it cuts down on typos and things like that. It really, uh, really speeds uh, programming. So we're going to go ahead and uh, stop our debugging session. And I'll close that down. And we're going to start digging in. I've already got AGW packet engine set up. I've got a little uh, micro TNC here. I've got a um, state of the art so I call it IC2AT circa 1980 something, um, which was just perfect for uh, this. We're going to open our command prompt. Uh, I guess like, I guess we still call it the DOS prompt. Uh, and we're going to start digging in. So hold on. feature when you're in the command prompt is if you can type in part of the word and you hit the tab key, it'll find the nearest match and complete the uh, path for you. So that's kind of a, a cheat, uh, but really saves me a lot of time. Okay, I'm going to start digging it. It's just a console application. It's an exe file. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to hit enter. Maybe I'll turn the radio on because I don't want to run any batteries. Okay, radio's on. We're going to hit enter. DigiNet uh, found our uh, TNC. It uh, knows, uh, knows I'm using a, a USB port uh, with sense of initialization. And uh, WE7NWP is sending a packet. And I'm on a different frequency here, so uh, he's hacking into my own network here. <laughs> okay. I'm going to fire up my, uh, my D7. Batteries are still good. Okay, opening TNC. Uh, you just notice Larry N7 BCP. It, uh, it captured my position, current position, which is uh, right here in building 40 cafeteria. I'm going to go ahead and send my message. You have to take my word for it here. We're going to input a message. Um, I'm going to say this is MS Digi, so I'm going to send it to MS Digi. Um, but one of the neat things about DigiNet is you can put in shortcuts to all these find commands. So I've predefined a query for coffee and called it question mark JA for Java. I think that was a cool uh, suggestion. Um, I don't know if that's a programming uh, joke or if it's a coffee joke. Anyway, uh, so we're going to send that. We're going to send that command. Boom. Yay, look at that. Okay, so it says MSVG, question mark JA, knows I want coffee. Uh, it says it's on a request for question mark JA from N7 BCP. And if you notice here, it says it found me in the MPERT list and it knows my location. And it sent back a message to me saying um, that, uh, let's see, what is this in here? Well, it's going to be gone. Anyway, see, copy one object was created and it's in Jitters Copy. It's almost off the screen. And right now it says there's one object added. I go into the D7. And someone's going to have to confirm for me that this actually says coffee one. Can you read that? 
announcement of the primary is the bank. Okay. Hey, so we got confirmed we actually got coffee, and so if I go uh, zoom in on that, it says Jitters Coffee 2200, um, gives me 0.7 miles away, so I'm going to have to walk a little bit for my coffee and uh, bearing, and I can walk over there and get my coffee. So um, that pretty much wraps it up. I'm going to finish off the slides here. I'm going to turn off that magnifier. Okay, so we did our uh, application debugging. Hello. Maybe not. I think PowerPoint's done. It's probably ready for lunch. It's got no blood sugar. It's uh, so good. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there's a firewall for that. Um, okay, well, we'll just do it this way. Uh, we showed you how to inspect the, uh, the variables. Um, we, uh, we said don't spam APRS, test your program carefully before you put it on the air. Uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, I also played around with Microsoft MapPoint integration, so if you have a copy of MapPoint, um, you can actually control it just like you did Yahoo. Um, that point would run locally on your computer, so it would not have to have a network connection. Um, you can use find you data, lots of uh, data for find you, so there's some, probably some interesting things you can do there. Um, I thought about maybe doing some proximity alerts. I could have a buddy list, and if, my, if uh, it shows uh, my buddies within uh, a mile, either I should go hide or you know, you know, give them a call, uh, depending on who my buddy is. Um, and what are you waiting for? Get started. This is a lot of fun. And it's time for questions. Uh, go ahead. Oh, the question is, have I tried this on, on Linux? Um, I have not. Um, Bill has some experience with that, and it, work, it works great. Uh, currently, you, you can't use these development tools to develop for Linux, um, but uh, the platform is there. Oh, so you're asking if I develop it with these tools, can I port this application over to Linux? Uh, it won't run right out of the box, no. It, uh, it expects um, there to be the Windows operating system and lots of Windows underpinnings there to be there. So, oh, oh, maybe we should talk offline. Maybe it does. Okay, so that's the inspiration. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Um, map point. Uh, I believe it's uh, basically the same interface as Streets and Trips. They're, they're almost, uh, they're very similar programs. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with uh, Streets and Trips, uh, that point works uh, as well. Um, next question. Oh, in the back? Um, have you thought about if people are creating modules, programs, how we can all combine them into, let's call it a APR server, uh, where you can add people's modules and programs so you can thought about how to create a framework for doing that? Uh, very interesting. So the question is, uh, if we've got lots of people excuse me, creating these programs, how can they find out about them possibly, and how can we put them into a single service where people can add to the network uh, with their modules? Um, I've given it some thought. I think the place to start is uh, having a place online where people can go see the code, upload their own, um, download, compile, and run it. Um, but it would be interesting to talk about how we can uh, do that more globally where you can submit your code and have it uh, just part of the network. I think there's probably some question too about is this necessarily on the APRS network on 1.4.39 uh, is that the place for this sort of service? Do we put it on 9600 baud? Do we find another frequency? These are things we can talk about. Yes. So the question is, this interface works with APRS and talks to TNCs and sends to APRS. Can it, 
kind of be interfaced with the DSTAR hardware and put that on the DSTAR network. Um, unfortunately, I don't know enough about DSTAR to answer that question. Um, DigiNet is open source, so um, the source code is freely available. And if there's a way to interface with uh, DSTAR, um, TNCs, probably has a command structure. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, DSTAR device would look like an Ethernet or a phone port. I don't see any reason why you couldn't open a network uh, socket or a serial port and do that, but you're probably going to have to modify DigiNet a little bit. And, but, yeah, by the way, DigiNet source is very well laid out. Uh, it's, not, it's not difficult to uh, parse. Uh, more questions? Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, so uh, um, the statement was Streets of Trips uh, doesn't have the same uh, functionality as MapPoint for interfacing and using the APIs. Uh, MapPoint is um, a little more expensive, um, and I do know that MapPoint works uh, with uh, this scenario. And um, uh, very good. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening, and I hope you all like that.